after the interception, extradition, and rearrangement of the leader of the outlawed indigenous people of Biafra, Namde Kano, by the federal government last week. He was granted access to his council, Ifanye Ejofo. Mr. Ejofo will now be joining us from Abuja to discuss the legal battle ahead as he seeks to defend his client against the witty charges that have been preferred against him by the Nigerian state. Good morning, uh, if I age your four, and welcome to the morning show. Great pleasure to have you joining us this morning. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Abati. Good so morning. much. It's a pleasure meeting. It's a, it's a pleasure being in your platform this morning. Thank you so much, Mr. Abati. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Well, if I age your four, you are counsel uh, to um, de Kano. And you'll be quoted in the paper saying that your client has been uh, badly treated not just by the uh, Nigerian authorities, but, but also the Kenyan authorities involved in the entire saga. Although the government of Kenya has, said, has pleaded innocence in all of this, saying that they were not involved in any way whatsoever. What are the issues involved uh, in terms of the procedure adopted by the uh, Nigerian government and the extent of the involvement of the Kenyan authorities? If you may just uh, present your case. Thank you so much, Mr. Bati. Uh, let's go straight to the point. Well, I have a number of issues I wanted to, to address in the course of this discourse. Um, first of all, there was a clear collaboration between the Kenyan government and Nigerian government. Uh, I'm happy now that they are denying the fact that Namde Kano was arrested in their place and also handed over to the Nigerian government. But I can assure you that by the time we finish with them at the international court, they will never remain the same. What's important at this stage, and I'm, I've already made known to the world, is that he was arrested at the airport on the 19th day of June 2029, 21. And uh, he was taken to an unknown residence. That is a fact. He wasn't taken to a custody, and they recognized the official custody of the police over there. He was taken to an unknown residence where he was subjected to inhuman treatment. Nandi Kano was tortured, maltreated and beaten, mercilessly beaten. So these are facts within our knowledge confirmed by him to us. So after spending eight days in their custody, illegal custody, they now become the, on the Nigerian counterpart to come for him. And by the time they came, Nandi Kano was apparently unconscious at the point they came to, came to pick him. He was unconscious, he was life, near lifeless at the time they were back taking him to Nigeria. So, and consequently, they brought him here. So now, to tell you the, the, the level of their co 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 conspiracy and the desperation to get him jailed at all costs by enemies, they brought him here on, tw on, a, on a Sunday, and the federal government is fully aware that I'm the late counsel to Nnamdi Kano. And there's, a, there's a, a charge against him before the court, which has been subsisting Subsisting has been going on because after invasion of his premises on the 14th of September 2017 by the Nigerian military and soldiers who killed over 28 persons in his house and by out of providence he was narrowly escaped. We filed an application before the court for an inquest into what transpired in his house on the 17th of, 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 um, of, uh, of September 2017 for court to inquire as to what happened in his house, what led to his disappearance. And we are still in this process, because that is fundamental. This is a person that has expressed to the world that he's ready to come for his trial on October 14th, 2017. He wasn't planning to leave the, court, leave the country. He wasn't planning to run away from the trial. He was ready to come for the trial on October 14th, the matter was stated for commencement of trial. Then on, on uh, September 17th, his house was invaded. So to tell you that the government was not ready at the time to prosecute him because they have no evidence to establish even the charge preferred against him to even date. So they went after his life. Now it's compelling on the part of the court to inquire what happened to this person I granted bail? What led to his disappearance? Then surprisingly on the 28th day of March 2019 when the matter came up for for shorties to show cause why they will not be committed for something. Why they were unable to produce Nandekano. 
That was the proceedings of that day. The court gave an order. Revoking his bow. Then we said no. Then because the court should be bound by its records. We said no. And we filed an application to get out of vacated. Since 2019 to date, the matter had several come up before the court. The same court. And the court was not inclined to hear this application to vacate the order. And the worst thing is that the federal government has not filed any response to this application before the court. They will not filed a response in counter to application to get out of vacated. They were not interested. What they are interested is to how to get in that canal at all at, 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 at all means available to them. So now he was brought into this country on Sunday after being detained, maltreated, subjected to all forms of injury, maltreated, and inflicted with severe injuries on account of handcuff that lasted his, on his hands for over, over four hours till the, till, till before he was brought to court. And you can see him on handcuff in, in, in court on that day. Those injuries are still there. And a number of medical issues he's having today on account of what was the kind of treatment that was meted out to him. So they took him to court on a Tuesday. Labaran, Chaibu Labaran, who is the counsel that was in court on that day representing federal government, is fully aware that by the Sefa age of four, is the lead counsel in this matter. And I've been, I've been in court with him in all cases affecting them, the Canada IPOB. You never extended the courtesy of, inf of informing me that this matter, that my client was arrested, was abducted, because in this case, wasn't, wasn't arrested. So but when we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. He was abducted and kidnapped from Kenya and brought him to this country. So now he, he, he didn't feel it confident. He didn't see it confident or didn't come appropriate to inform me that my client was arrested and has been brought to court on Tuesday. So that shows there's a collaboration between the government in question, as we stand today, and the people who are appearing before them. Because if, if, if at all there was any element of IOT of, of uh, of, uh, of transparency, what they're doing uh, is compelling on the part to, for the, on the part of the AG, not uh, the, the lawyer representing the attorney for the election, to inform me that they are coming to court on Tuesday, so I can come to court and see my client. I don't know what happened, and this is quite from what happened. So on Tuesday, I took him to court, and the court asked them, "Where is Barrister Jofor? Is he not in court? Is he not in, was he not informed?" They said, "No, they arrested him and brought him to Abuja on Sunday, and he's caught today." So now he has. There's an underlying fact that my client will not get fair trial in that court. That's settled. The issue of fair trial has been taken away by this collaboration. But we, we keep on watching. We are putting, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are going to see them in court. So that is what happened as of today. I've seen him and he has given me every information and detail about what transpired in Kenya, how he was arrested, how he was taken to a non destination. And how he was maltreated, how they nearly killed him over there. And it's obviously from what he told me that it was at the behest of the federal government that they were doing those things. So, until when they beckon on them to come, these are against an, on, in, on, an obvious infraction to all international laws and treaties. So, but at, at, at that level, we're addressing it. At, we're going to address an international court at that level. At that level. So, um, let me concern myself what's happening in the country. So it's obvious from every indication that my client will not get a fair trial in this court. Obvious. Until when the contrary is established. And now, Nandi Kano was remanded in prison custody. Let me underline this fact. Long before he was granted bail, he spent over two years in custody before he was granted bail. The court itself is away that he was in prison custody before he was granted bail. And at the point he was in prison custody, Nandi Kano at any point, there was never at any point in time, made any effort. Made an effort to leave the prison without the judicial process. Now, they remanded him in DSL custody, where they made it near impossible for his relatives where we chance to visit him, except on appointment by his lawyers. So that in that in itself has also graduated to, graduated to what I call mental torture. He's been subjected to mental torture as I speak to you now. Because when somebody is in incarceration as a political prisoner, which is his. He has no access to his wife, he has no access to his brothers, he has no access to relative to discuss with them and interact with them. Even lawyers who are coming to see him are coming on a, are coming on a specific approval by the DGSSS. So it shows that he is undergoing mental torture. And it is worse still when Nandekano is 
he, he, he is under a, a debilitating health situation. He has a medical condition that needs to be addressed as quick as possible. Because it's only a living that can face trial. So this, I can stop at this time. I'll ask, come up with a second question. Thank you. Wow. That, you've given us quite a lot to unpack. I want to start off with Kenya, because, you know, you've said you're going to address that in an international court. But Kenya's extradition laws make it quite clear yeah. the kind of offenses, the nature of offenses for which extradition can be granted. There's a list, and treasonable felony is not in that list. In fact, the law in Kenya, the extradition law, states that fugitives are not to be surrendered if the offense is of a political character. So you mentioned the charges proffered against your clients. Has the Nigerian government now expanded the range of charges levied against your client? That's my first question. What are the charges that Namdekanu is facing now? My second question, you've said that you don't feel that your client will get a fair trial in Nigeria, but he has been given access to you, his legal representative. What else would you need to see to convince you that a fair trial is possible, as is his right under Section 36 of the Nigerian Constitution? Thank you so much. You will recall that on the, on the day he was taken to court, that was last week, Tuesday, uh, uh, Namikano was allowed to address the court because I was not in court. I was not in court. So... That enough shows you that's the problem. Now the kind is not a lawyer. And he has no competent address the court. He must, he, he must address the court. Because if needful was done, I would have been in court to address the court. And also apply to the court that he should be remanded in prison custody. So that is a clear violation of his, of his constitutional right to refer trial. So, it, so because I was not in court, he was allowed to address the court. So that shows you that it's, that it's more to eat than me the eyes. Because they have, Labaran has my number. The, the office of AG has my number. They have simply put on call, a call across to me that I've asked, they've, they've abducted, whatever they call it, they classify it as my client somewhere in Kenya. I'm brought into here. And I take him to court on, on Tuesday to continue to try. Then I'll be in court on Tuesday. And, it, and also convince the court of reason why he should be sent to prison, to the correctional center. But in this case, the court allow him, which is abnormal, which is unethical. Allow him to address the court. Why should court be asking him why he run away when I'm not there? We have an application before the court which contains his affidavit on oath, the post to before a commissioner for oath in Israel, stating the facts of what transpired in his house on September 17, 2017. September 14, 2017. How he nearly escaped death. How he was ready to come to court on 14th of October 2017 to face trial. Then we this are before the court, and court never entertained it. Court never entertained this. This is a record black and white before the court. Court has never entertained this application before the court. So I will be craving the court or at any at, at any adjournment for the court to hear it. Because it's fundamental to his fair trial, to, to the right. The court will hear and understand what transpired in his house. That's very fundamental. Then the court is now allowed to address the court on this fact, which are already before the court. So that's area why that's why I'm entertaining fear that he will, he will, he will be granted a fair trial in this court. So now, coming, coming to what happened in court, the matter has now been adjourned to 26th of October, uh, to, uh, to 6th of uh, July, well, 2021. Age of four. Let me say this to age you. Age of four. Sorry uh, to me... interrupt you. We need to take a short break. When we take a short break, I see you are very passionate about this. We we're going to unpack all of those issues, and there will be more than enough time to do so. So we take this short break, and we'll come back to you. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News Channel. Our guest is totally fine, age of four, uh, counsel uh, to uh, the leader of the indigenous peoples of Biafra, uh, Namde Kano. Well, if I, yes, you said a lot, and we've listened to you, but uh, we would like you to conclude your thoughts on what you were saying. But take this along with some of the things you wanted to say. First, you were accusing the Kenyan authorities. But aren't we dealing here with the case of a fugitive from the law? A fugitive from the law who was also organizing against the Nigerian state along borders. I'm sure as counsel, you are familiar with what is called cross-border crime, uh, transnational crime under public international law, and the role of Interpol uh, in that regard. 
Second, uh, justice, the court of justice being Yako, uh, when your uh, client was brought before the court uh, and then uh, he was uh, remanded in the custody of uh, DSS, the court specifically, Justice Nyako that is, asked that you should be contacted, the counsel should be contacted. But you were saying no attempt was made to get across to you with a phone call. But I thought that the court of justice in Yako uh, protected your interests by saying that going forward, when you know uh, the lordship announced the uh, adjournment to July 26, talked about counsel uh, for the defendant appearing uh, in court. And you are talking about bail. You are talking about medical condition. Now, do you think that your client is in a safe place to ask you know, for further bail, given the fact that he became a fugitive from the law? The rationalization that you gave uh, may not be tenable before the court. Thank you, Mr. Bathy. Um, I respect you so much. Let me just, uh, it's important for us to correct an impression at this stage. Um, my client is only a fugitive in the age of Nigerian law or court. Uh, so the prescription of IPOB has never been endorsed by any country of the world including any of African countries. So there's only a recognized, um, or recognized or probably given credence by the Nigerian courts and law and laws. So when, let me address the fourth point, part. We, we have proceeding, we have what I call extradition proceedings. The fact that the, he was allegedly committed a problem or probably, or probably on, a, on, a, on a warrant to be arrested cannot stop the country from going into what they call extradition proceedings. Before it can be, it is, it is a, what they call it, it is a tradition can be granted by that country. And you have heard it see that even the offenses being, he was being charged of at the time he was abducted from Kenya did not fall within the items specified under the Kenyan laws as those offenses that can be, can be, can be had under tradition proceedings. It's clear. So what we are saying is that in the, in the, it's a subjective to Nigeria opinion. It's a law, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fugitive law in Nigerian court. Why is it that any, no country of the world has endorsed IPOB as a terrorist organization? Because they are fully aware of the, my correspondence with them across the world that IPOB is a legal organization. IPOB is not a valid, valid no, it's a non valid organization. And the, the order of the court obtained through the back door, obtained through the back door, is being challenged before the court of appeal today. So they will allow the proceedings before the court of appeal to end because we filed an appeal against that order time your sleep, challenging the poor production of IPOB. Now, the federal government it took them almost a year and eight months to respond to all applications to file before the court of appeal. That notwithstanding, we still subjected, we still submitted to a delay. We never oppose that delay. And it's also when we have an application for stay of proceedings before the Court of Appeal. And also have an application to stop them from executing that order. So these are applications before the Court of Appeal. And they've been run away from the court. I can confirm that to you. I have documented this case file. They've been run away from the court. I'll tell you when they file their, resp their, their responsible belief. Even on the day they file a motion for them to enter, to enter, to enter appearance out of time or for their brief to be accepted out of time, we find our reply to their brief on the same day in court of appeal, expecting the court to allow us to hear our appeal. And the court didn't hear it. The court, the court didn't hear it. The parent considered to hear our appeal, didn't hear it. About 10 o'clock, they get, send a message across to us that I will not, the court will not be sitting. Till date. So, now, coming to the a, a aspect of not informing me before he was taken to court, I'm not, I'm not talking about what transpired in open court. I'm talking about the duty on the prosecution, on the part of the prosecution in this case, to call me when he was arrested and inform me because he owed me that compelling obligation to inform me and tell me that the matter is called, the client, my client has been arrested or abducted, whatever you call it. Then he'll be taken to court on Tuesday. Then I'll be in court to address the court on some, on some issues, not to my client to allow to be, to be asked to address the, address the court. So... And the court is fully away that it was coming to court on that Tuesday. Because if you watch the proceedings that took place on that day, proceedings of the court, it never lasted for more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes. It never. It was just brought to court and informed the court if we would the transfer into DS custody. The press were, were stopped from seeing him, from interviewing him. He was, he was blindfolded. 
So tell me what kind of what has, what offense has he committed? Even in the eyes of Nigerian law, now they can't see presuming innocent today. Is he presuming innocent? By virtue of 35 6 of the constitution. So is he presumed innocent today of the all allegations against him? So he's being subjected as, as we speak now. Of, of course, you know a lot of things are going on. Both media trials. People are being paid to come and confess and say some things against Nam Nikano. But I don't think I don't think I have any issue with that one. When we get to court, we'll address it. Media trials are ongoing. Somebody will come and tell the world that I'm an ESM member. I was admitted to and so they now they can't say this. It's an open court that we have to establish that thing. So we have to be second spent on the media trial going on against Nam Nikano because he has been arrested, he has been abducted and brought to Nigeria. So what I'm what my my challenge and my concerns is stem from the fact that I was not informed. I was arrested. One, two. I was not informed that he was being taken to court on a Tuesday. So I believe the Rabbi and Shaibu is under compelling you to tell me because okay. we are sending correspondence. Oh, okay. I have my number. I have no okay. number. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if you can hear me real quickly. So what happens on the 26th? A lot of people are talking. You're talking about bail now. You're talking about the fact that it's got medical condition. You should get bail. But on the other side, on the side of the government, what they're saying is he's jumped bail before. So how will it be easy for you to be able to prove that case that someone that has jumped bail before he will let go? You're also saying that they should put him in prison and take him out of GSS custody. Are those going to be the things you're going to be pushing on the 26th when you get back to court? Thank you, Rufai. What I'm saying is that in the first place, Nandu Kano never jumped bail. Let it be clear to everybody. He never jumped bail. Because if the federal government was serious about prosecuting Nandu Kano, can, if that shows about prosecuting him, they were allowed him to come to court on September 14th, 2017, October 14th, 2017, to face his trial. Are you telling me that soldiers that invaded Nam Kano are not from Fabuja? Are they not? Are they acting where they, they, they acted under the instruction of someone in Abuja State? The answer is no. They came from Abuja. They have the instruction of the federal government to go to his house. So and they are aware. They are fully aware that Nam Kano was scheduled to be in court on October 14th. And in one of his broadcasts prior, prior to the time of prior to the invention of his premises, he told the world that he's coming to call to over one million members of IPOB. He informed he the court to the world. So when they allow him, if they have any case against him, to come to the court on October 14th, probably at the end of the proceedings, they will arrest him. So he never jumped back. This is a person, okay, assuming, assuming without considering to the fact that they will succeed in killing him on 14th of October, on uh, September 14th, when they invented his premises, will he be talking about? He's trial today or not? The answer is no. Because it's only a living that can face trial. And nothing more. If he was abducted, the succession abducted him on, 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 on that day, they invaded his premises and killed over 28 persons, civilians or uncivilians. Then we shouldn't be talking about what they're saying today. So, but by out of providence, he will never escape being killed. So these are people who are fully aware that he was scheduled to be in court on October 14th for the trial. And then Abuja here. So why can't you wait for him to come to court if I have any case against him? So, and we have supplied the court this fact. We have supplied the court circumstances that led to his disappearance from court. We have informed the court and convincingly that Nana Khan was ready to start his trial. But for the fact that he was, his life is being, is under threat. So, the court he has his under compelling obligation to listen to see applications before him. Okay. And make findings or decisions one way or the other. Right. If I may come so in here. So, he didn't jump down. He wasn't to come to court. Okay, according to you, he didn't jump bail, but did he or did he not violate the bail conditions that he was given? Because you recall, the bail conditions were stringent. He was not to hold rallies or have meetings, which he did. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my, my sister. Let me say this to you, eh? because it's important for us to inform you appropriately. And whatever I'm saying today to you today, I will furnish you with documents to that effect, black and white. Before the date slated for his trial, the federal government, acting through the Attorney General Federation, filed an application to vacate, to vacate his bail, to, back, to, to, to vacate his bail, right? On the premise that he has violated his bail condition. This application was filed in black and white and served on me. And I responded, to that application, because it's a matter for court to decide. We cannot say, we cannot at this stage, at, at, at that point in time, or, pro, or probably during that, during that period, determine when Nani can violate his bad condition or not. And also, I want you to appreciate the fact that I had also filed an application to validate their bad condition before they file their own. 
So these are pending application before the court. The court for court to hear. Hear my application to vary his bail condition. Hear the one filed by the federal government that he has violated the bail condition. And also fear the one I filed in reply to what federal government filed. Stating that Nana can never violate his bail condition. So they're supposed to hear those applications. The court is under a duty to hear that application. And make decisions one way or the other. So it is not in our it's not it's not it's not within our rights today to state that Nana can violate his bail condition at that time, point in time. Because have application before the court, for the court to hear and tell me. So I still maintain today that none can never violate any boy condition. Anyway, Mr. Because Joffa. Because we have application for the court to vary it. Also Mr. The, Mr. Joffa, your point is clear. But before we go, you said you are going back to the court to do the needful. Will you define for us and for the benefit of our viewers what you mean by doing the needful? What will be your prayers before the court when you show up there on July 26th? Uh, Mr. Ruben Anabati, thank you so much. What I want to say to that effect is that we've already filed applications are going into the court today. Uh, because we have preliminary applications we need to file entertain by the court before the 26th of July. As I speak to you, his care condition is deteriorating every day. So, and that needs to be addressed as quick as possible. That needs to be addressed as, because it's only a living that can face trial. If anything happened to Nani Kano before the 26th of July, 2021, the matter was expected for hearing. That means the trial will not go on. So, the need to be attended to as quick as possible. And we are going to call to get an order of court to ensure that he's given attention. That's fundamental. Because his life falls before we talk about trial. So, that's what I mean by needful, doing the needful. We're going back to the court to do the needful. Then, I am, I've had a number of places where they're saying about amendment of charges. I have no problem with that. Let's submit the amended charge. Right? Yeah. So, and also, uh, uh, let me use this opportunity to tell, to crave, the, to, to, to appeal to you, and also appeal to the world, to tell the government that I have to be protected, because my life is under threat as I speak to you as his lawyer. I tell as bad as my life, people were killed in my premises, I cannot move, I cannot sleep down with one, two eyes closed. So let the world intervene in this case, because I must be given protection to defend my client. I don't know what I've done to deserve to be, to, for, 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 to be killed. Because I'm defending IPOP. It's within my constitutional right as a lawyer, lawyer to defend anybody that come across me. And I'm doing justice to, to, to that. So let me use this opportunity and this platform to appeal to the world to prevent the federal government to protect my life. To stop those who, who are, who are hell-bent on killing me. Okay. They have been looking for me all over the place to kill. Not, not that I've committed any offense to law. But they want to assassinate me at all costs by enemies. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Mr. Joffo, real quickly. Uh, have those threats, like you talked about, been reported to the police? And secondly, what are these new charges against Namdi Kano? What, what, what I understand that happened is that, you know, before, the, before Namdi Kano was arraigned in 2015, we have, first of all, they started with about three count charge. Then subsequently after that, they filed a mandatory of 11 count charge. And the... We filed an objection to that charge, to the, to the 11 count charge preferred against him. And the court struck out seven, eight out of that 11, remaining three. So, and even, the, even in the court, the court ruling, which I will make available to your people, the court made a remark that even the three count charge she pending against them, the canon, as a canon, 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 that the proof of evidence before the court cannot even substantiate that charge. Cannot substantiate it because they are porous. So, but, for the benefit of that, is giving the prosecution the benefit to come forward with their, with their witnesses to establish this charge against him. So now, what we are, what we are, what we are seeing today is that those charge, the court struck out, has been revived by the federal government. That's what we are seeing today. The court, the charge, the federal government, the court has struck out, the account charge, the court has struck out, struck out sometime in the course of the proceeding, has been revived, resurrected by the federal government again. But my brother, we have no problem. We know that Nam the Kano, the whole world knows he's a political prisoner. Uh, so we know he's a political prisoner, and we are going to impanel a fortified legal team for him. And in court, we resolve every aspect of items of the charge they are bringing before the court. We are not running away from the court. We believe in the judicial process. We have impl impl implicit confidence in the judicial process. So, but when things are going wrong, I will, let, I will inform the world because I must be alive to my duties.
I mean, what are these charges? You've not specifically, you know, stated these charges so that the world can know. These three, char these charges that have been brought back, like you said, what are these charges? It's... It, 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 it's an old charge. I may not be able to, to rephrase offhand. It has to do with the um, possession of um, illegal equipment, belonging to a lawful society. Uh, and the man, the man, the call that at the point they file this, this charge, the charging with belonging to a lawful society, IPOB has not been prescribed at that time. And the call stated in his ruling that IPOB at the time is not a lawful society. So, and on the percent of that order, they stop arresting IPOB members when they come to court. So, and to make things easy for them, they went back to the court and without a knowledge of obtain an order to prescribe IPOB, which I challenge before the court of appeal today. So, these are charges they file, belong to uh, protection of uh, materials uh, and also um, what I no, call it, and uh, other, no, other, 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 other offenses that are not be standing up front. I don't think the issue is about the 11 count uh, charge, those ones are in the public domain. Recently, we were told that the government is going to uh, amend the charges, add more charges, including murder charges. Now, have you been informed? Have you been apprised of that? Uh, because, you know, previously, the biggest charge was treasonable felony, which carries the maximum of life imprisonment. But if murder charges are going to be added, then that's a capital offense. Uh, that will carry uh, the death penalty. So are you aware of this amendment? of these additional charges, have you been informed ahead? And as for Kenya that you've been talking about, the High Commissioner of Kenya to Nigeria insists that in fact it's derogatory, it's insulting, it's malicious, and it's defamatory of the person of the President of Kenya for anybody to suggest that Kenya was involved in any other way. And that was why I asked you the question about trans-border crime, transnational crime, you know, cross-border crime. And whether, in fact, what we're dealing with here is uh, Interpol working directly with the Nigerian government. Okay, uh, Mr. Abati, for the benefit of that, let me just spare some time and address you on this point. I wanted not to say it, but let me just say for the benefit of that, for the poor to know. When Namdi Kano was arrested, in, were abducted in Kenya by the, by the, by the Kenya police force in a, at the airport. He was accused, he was primarily accused by the, by the people that arrested him of committing offense, for committing treason offense in their, on their country. And at the point in time, they were apparently or presupposedly acting under the, under the, under the impression that they don't, they don't know the person they are dealing with. So now, the game changed when they took him to a place other than the police station or to any, any of the approved official detention facility of the Kenya government. They took him there and started treating him. So they were discussing with him, interrogating him on the basis that he has committed offense against, against the Kenyan government. So I am telling you what I have with me, the, facts, the impeccable facts I have with me. And I have every evidence to establish that in the course of time. Because when we get to that international court, the Kenyan government will come to defend themselves. We have facts, information, documents to show what happened to him and where it happened. So, and when they became convinced after eight days of maltreating him, torturing him, subjecting him to all forms of inhuman treatment, that now the canon never committed any offense unto law in Kenya, a British citizen for that matter, then the land become, because it's a collaborative something. It's like there was a conspiracy in the first place. So, because they know probably he has meetings, he will be attending a meeting in Kenya. So, they have that intel. So, the land beckon on the Nigerian government to come and pick him without due process of law being adhered to. So, if he has committed any offense unto law over there, the member is a British citizen. They were subjected into selection proceedings. So, this took place in Kenya. And we have the facts, we have documents to show to the international community and in the, in the fullness of time. As I speak to you, I have written to foreign government. His attorney and overseas has, are taking up the matter over there. So, they, 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 they are being smart by half for denying the fact that Nani Kanu was never arrested in Kenya. Let them go to court. We're already in court with them. They're going to take them to court anymore for now. On what transpired in Kenya. That they, they, they was abducted. Taken to non residence treat, treat, they, 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 they were treated. Beaten mercilessly. Tortured. So even as a matter of fact, 
When the Nigerian counterpart came, they became as scared that the fact that Nana Kalamata have died in their may, may have died, may have died in their hiding, they didn't conduct proper examination, medical examination. That was when they took him to a hospital in Nairobi and confirmed what the, his medical situation. So as I, I kept on to emphasize that his medical condition is deteriorating every day. And I'm telling the world that it is better for him to be take, uh, given att medical attention than to die before the date of the hearing. Because, and if anything happens to him today, he's today before the Nigerian court. He's today before the Nigerian court in Nigerian custody. Nigerian government will be held responsible. So they should take him to, they should allow his medical expert to visit him and give him attention. Well, then, uh, uh, and also face his trial. We're not against the trial. Let's let go on. Yeah, look, I, I get the impression when you keep referring to British citizenship uh, in Kanu's case, I see British citizenship is superior to Nigerian citizenship. Is that the case? And I still ask you about those additional charges. Have you been informed about what those additional charges are at this point? Th thank, thank, you, thank you so much. M Mr. Bati, there was no, there, as I speak to you, there's no additional charges against Namdekano. So he's being speculated over the media. I will be in a position to confirm to you that the federal government has amended the charges preferred against him to include charge of case of murder. And you see, one thing, we, we are oppressed a custodial, a custodial system of government. So let them come to court and establish whatever crime he committed. I have no problem with that. Prefer a charge of any magnitude, I have no problem. It's one thing to say somebody committed an offense, then another thing to establish the items, ingredients of those offenses before the court. But so as I speak to you, I've not been served with any amended charge against him. I've not been, I've not been informed that they filed a charge against him before the, before the high, federal high court. So right. the, okay. the, 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 the what you are hearing over the social media are mere speculative, as I can confirm that to you. Right, Mr. Ejiofo. Um, you know the binding effect of legal precedent. So I want to remind you of Asari Dokubo and the Federal Republic of Nigeria, where the court upheld the corporate existence of Nigeria as indivisible, indissoluble, a harmonious sovereign state, such that, such that the rights of the individuals are suspended when it comes to national security. What is your comment on that ratio in the context of Namdi Kanu's case? The, the Asari, Asari Dokubo's case has to do, what, what they are relying to, has to do, you know, it, 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 it has to do with application for his bail, when application for his bail was made. And that was the ground upon which the court said they cannot grant him bail. So, but in this case, we have not made an application for his bail in this instance. We are talking about his health condition. And I am not saying that you lease him to go and attend to himself. At our attend to medical challenges. What I'm saying, in effect, is that they should allow his experts. He has medical doctors who will come and attend to him where he is. Then we will not go back to court. So we don't start, we're not, if we don't start applying for bail now before the court. So what you are talking about, for him to be given immediate medical attention to avoid dying in, dying in custody. Because his health is deteriorating every day on account of the mental, of the torture meted out to him in Kenya. And the extension of the torture here, because by keeping him in solitary confinement, amount to grievous torture, grievous torture, torture. So when we get to the bridge on the cases you cited, we'll cross it. I have no problem. We've been in the matter since 2015, and I can assure you that the federal government have no evidence to establish any case against Nam the Kano. Okay. Uh, As real, a matter of fact, real quickly, uh, interesting turn, uh, Barry Sergio you, Four. You, you talked about him taking to, being taken to a hospital in Kenya. You said there was a medical report out of there. Uh, is there anything we need to know as regards that? Because now you are saying that same radical report is based on what you're talking about, that is ill health, and that's why you're asking for a bail. Or you want his experts, a medical expert, to come see him. Is there anything we need to know about that medical report out of Kenya? What I'm saying is that the medical report in Kenya is where he was examined, briefly examined before taking, being brought to Nigeria, is clear. And we are pursuing it over there. So... Let me hope that the Kenyan government will not also, uh, will not also compromise in this regard because we, 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 we have records to that effect. So, but what I'm saying is that Nandekano heart condition is in a terrible state. So, and we are appealing to the government of the state.
the government of the Nigerian government, to allow the, his medical doctors to examine him where he's being kept. So I don't want to go into the details of what is contained in his medical report. Now, so, but in the course of time, you will get to hear all. But I've told you as a lawyer, as his lawyer, whom he has narrated everything to, the circumstance that led to his arrest, the what was done to him, and also where, where he was being, where he was kept. Terrible environment he was kept for eight days before being brought to Nigeria. So we have those facts with us, with us and other compelling evidence we may not like to make public now at this stage until when we get to that bridge. So what I'm saying, if for them to allow his medical expert to examine him and give him attention now, because well, we don't have no for, confidence in the system where he's being kept. We're, 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 we've run out of time, but uh, you know, I still recall that you didn't ask, answer that question about whether being a British citizen is superior to being a Nigerian citizen and whether Nam De Kanu is no longer a Nigerian citizen and whether a, Niger a British citizen can do as he wishes within Nigerian territory. But in any case, we'll leave that hanging. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on The Morning Show. <laughs>